Kansas, the United States, and the land of the world receive more rights. You'd be amazed how just a plain housewife from Argonia, Kansas, could be involved in something so important. It all started while I was doing my laundry, Monday morning, April 4th, 1887. A group of Argonian men came hurrying up the street, and to my surprise, told me I was the candidate for mayor. The reason it was such a surprise to me was that the only thing I belonged to that is connected in any way to politics was the Women's Christian Council Committee. The WCCU had been organized in Argonia in 1883. The organization had called a conference to let the group of men they thought would be good city leaders. These men were all dry. Another group of men in Argonia felt the WCCU was getting a little out of hand. And they decided to play a prank on to embarrass the organization. I happened to be the only member who lived in the city limits, so I was picked to be the butt of the joke. These men were all left in the litigation. The men made up a ticket for the city election field, and they listed candidates for city offices. They put me down as candidate for mayor. Why didn't I know about this ahead of time? The law said that a list of candidates did not have to be shown to the public until the morning of the election. And that's what they did. The governor said, the Republican chairman said, let's speak to Metheronian and really elect her in office. I was elected mayor with two-thirds of the vote. Here's a picture of me in those days. By this time, women in Kansas already had the right to vote in school elections but they had just received the right to vote in city elections the year I was elected to office. So you can see what a stir my election caused. At my first city council meeting, I told my council members, this is a new venture. The odds of Kansas and the U.S. are waiting and watching to see how I run things. I want you to know, it's your responsibility, not mine, but I will help you to the best of my ability. Gentlemen, what is your pleasure? You are the duly elected officials of this town, and I am merely your presiding officer. After this, we got along just fine. My term in office was almost uneventful. I only arrested two draymen for not buying licenses, and warned some boys about throwing rocks at a vacant house. When my term was up, I didn't run again because I felt I needed to be home with my husband and four children. When I left office, I told women, that they can accomplish more to influencing their families than by entering politics. But I do believe women should go to the fold and vote. As you can see, my election accidentally happened to me, but it wasn't that way with the women who followed me in public office. You, you'd be amazed at the achievements they had made in the short time following my election. Just one year after I was elected, Absolutely elected in all women's government, along with the female mayor. He took twice the town's most prominent men to be nominated, and they won by a three to one margin. The town folks would break about the prosperous system of trade, the increase in population, and the striking public improvement, which the council has seen to. Another example of a woman fighting for women's rights was Eula Wilson. She was the mayor of Honeywell, Kansas, several years after I was mayor of Argonia. Although my term in office was not difficult at all, she had exceptional difficulties. Her council members did not show up when she called a council meeting, so she took the city records and went home. The next time, she got an invitation to meet with her council members in a bedroom of a multiple hotel. She did not attend the meeting, but instead, wrote a letter to Governor Sepp asking him to out the whole bunch. Our council of Topeka got involved and they elected a all-woman all cabinet made up of five women whose job was to advise the Topeka City Commission on matters of importance to them. These matters included slums, parks and alleys, garbage removal, and other matters of good welfare. The first request of these women was to put two women on the police force. These members were to wear no uniforms, except the stars, and to carry no weapons, except for half heads. One of Kansas' first only police officers was Sue Hudson from Chinook. Her official title was 
City Police Number 5, and she was in charge of social welfare work in Kansas. By 1910, there were 550 women in the banking field in Kansas. This list was compiled by the State Bank Commissioner's Office. Also by 1910, there were 62 women holding elective public offices, and 2,000 were in the public employee. By 1911, there were 45 counties in Kansas that had elected at least one woman to county office. Women holding county office usually retired after one term, but as they began being elected more frequently, they began, they began to run for, for re-election term after term, and they had more influence on the government. And by 1912, women in Kansas had the right to vote in state elections. Not everybody, including women, thought that women being in politics was such a good idea, though. But there were enough who supported women's rights, but the idea soon put on around the country and around the world. And I like to think I played a small part in that group. Women involved in national women's rights began writing to those of us in Kansas involved in the women's rights movement. One of those was Frances C. Willard. She was an advocate of women's rights and an outstanding national leader of the WPTU. She wrote me congratulating, she wrote me asking me to write her, telling her the good of a woman's ballot as a temper weapon and the advantage, advantages of women in office. Another letter was from Susan B. Anthony. She was the leader of the women's rights movement in the United States. She wrote me congratulating me for my important movement. When I met her at the Kansas Legal Suffrage Association Convention, I was thrilled. As you can see, my election to office and election of those Kansas women to follow me has led the way for women to get involved in politics. You may wonder what influenced Kansas women to lead the way. It has a lot to do with our environment. Kansas women had responsibility to take care of their families, do chores, do housekeeping, and get medical services because there was seldom a doctor available. They had a strong set of values which they taught their children. Where there was no schools or churches, they also became ministers and teachers. Kansas women were independent. Many times, families could not afford to hire extra help. The women were outside working side by side with their husbands. They would find out about the current political issues and often discuss them. Kansas women wanted the same order in the world as they had in their homes, so they began with the first one. They campaigned on issues closely related to home and family, such as the availability of books and the threat of alcohol. Soon their issues became items reaching brothers and homes, such as threats to American Indians, foreign economic problems, the environment, and their own political participation. As you can see, Kansas women have been leading the way for a long time, but they are still progressing today. In 1978, Kansas Nancy Castlebaum became the first woman to be elected to the United States Senate. And just last year, Kansas elected their first woman governor, Joan Fain. Partly because of what happened to me and other Kansas pioneer women, women in the United States got the right to vote in national elections in 1920. 1920, and they're still progressing today. Because of what happened to me, women in Kansas got a long, a big start in the long show of equal rights.